Hey everybody, happy Friday. What a beautiful day it is. And today we want to talk some about 20th century art. Uh, the 20th century, of course, being the 1900s. And you all may remember it fondly, as I do. It's a century where a lot of things are happening. And because of all the things that are happening so quickly, it seems like that time itself has sped up. Um, the Industrial Revolution leads to all kinds of things, including mass communication. And communication spreads all over the world in a way that seems to make the world much smaller. And what used to be conflicts just between two countries uh, now involve the entire world. We get two world wars in the same century, which is amazing, and an amazing amount of death and destruction and also an amazing amount of technological breakthrough and artistic influence and so we get all these isms we get tons of isms um, and new art movements seem to be happening uh, every year and then art movements spur other art movements and art itself changes a lot so it's no longer just sanctioned by the very wealthy or sponsored by the state uh, now art is in the process of becoming a personal expression and something that moves within its own way so art isn't necessarily used to promote certain beliefs or agendas or it still is in some cases but uh, you hear the term art for art's sake the idea that art itself is important outside of other ideas and that it's a signifier of high culture. Um, a lot of things change in the 20th century. We talked some before about how France has become the center of what's considered the art world, the center of innovation and in art. Um, in France, that artwork starts to become more influenced by things that we saw during the Impressionist movement than in the by the post-impressionist and color itself instead of just being something used to realistically describe an object visually color becomes an expressive element that happened a lot uh, in the post-impressionist period with artists like Van Gogh um, and then color gets used not only as a descriptive element but also in kind of a scientific exploratory way with Cezanne and the way that influences artists in the 20th century include uh, this group that was known as the Fauves which is a word that uh, is kind of derogatory and it refers to them as wild beasts because of this really wild expressive use of color. Uh, one of the Fauve artists was Henri Matisse and this is his piece Red Room uh, from 1909. As you could see um, it's not just a representational piece. Of course, it does represent a scene, but the space has been completely flattened and color becomes this really vivid, uh, very expressive thing instead of just being used to describe objects. The patterning and the color from the tablecloth spreads up the wall uh, and it's very lifelike and it's very vivid. Um, described as wild beast painting I suppose and when compared to older traditions uh, such as the Renaissance when they kind of dominated art up until this point. Color as expression um, is something that we kind of take for granted now so when we look at a painting like this it, it doesn't seem really odd but at this time in 1909 uh, it would have uh, really been a strange sight because art just wasn't done this way. So when we look at artists like Matisse, we're looking at people that really uh, were groundbreakers as far as visual art goes. Painting and sculpture during this time do move more towards abstraction and away from representation. And in some cases, uh, artwork becomes completely 
abstract. And we talked about that some in, in chapter one, way back at the beginning of class, the idea that um, some art was non-representational because it didn't have a recognizable visual subject. Painters like Vasilir Kandinsky um, worked towards this idea of non-representational art. So he compared his paintings more to a musical score than a piece of visual art with the idea that music, like non-objective art, uh, doesn't copy something else. That it just exists on its own and it has its own language uh, and it has its own elements like rhythm and balance and uh, things such as that. In the realm of three-dimensional art like sculpture, uh, Brancusi also moves towards non-objective art. Uh, this piece you could still call representational, uh, the name of its bird in space, and you kind of get an idea uh, of a wing. Um, it gives you an idea of flight. Flight, by the way, being something else uh, invented in the early 20th century, so it was on the minds of a lot of people, including artists. This particular piece of artwork uh, was a source of a lot of controversy when it was shipped to the United States for an art exhibition. Uh, it was stopped at customs and there was a big debate about whether or not it could be defined as art and it ended up going to the Supreme Court uh, which upheld that yes this was a piece of art and therefore the artist didn't have to pay customs on it uh, when it was shipped in. In Europe there was uh, a movement called Cubism that kind of grew out of some explorations that were being done by the painter Cezanne uh, that we talked about. And there were two artists, uh, Brock and Picasso, who took some of Cezanne's ideas where he would uh, fragment space and see the landscape in a way that, that looked like it was flattened and fragmented in different pieces. And they took that and they developed a style that became known as Cubism. And like a lot of the styles that we've talked about, Cubism uh, at first was kind of an insult. It looks like a bunch of cubes. But it became a really dominant style um, in Europe and became very influential on a lot of painters, not just uh, painters, but sculptors as well. Like Fauvist art, Cubism flattened space. So just like the paint sitting on a flat canvas, uh, there was no attempt to disguise that, no attempt to create a photographic illusion. Um, after all, photography had already been invented. So another thing that Cubism did besides flattened space is it explored multiple viewpoints. So it was almost as if um, the artist's view was changing as they were creating the painting in that way. Uh, when something is seen from different angles, you get all these different viewpoints that are being shown to you at the same time. So cubism, in a way, involves time. It's a, it's a compression of time into a, a single vision, into a single moment. Picasso and other artists looked to different places for inspiration. So artists working in the 20th century weren't just looking at the Renaissance anymore. Uh, they were looking at different cultures um, and sometimes uh, cultures that had completely different artistic sensibilities. Picasso had a big collection of African artwork and African masks and you start to see some of that influence show up in his work. So uh, he wasn't the only European artist to borrow from these other cultures. One thing that you have to say about uh, artwork in this time period that visually while artists like Picasso were borrowing the appearance of African masks, they didn't seem too concerned about the other aspects of that artwork, like uh, what those masks represented and, and the cultural values that came with that. But they were very interested in the visual appearance. Uh, and we see those masks show up uh, in this Cubist piece by Picasso. Uh, the Damsels of Avignon, which... Uh, was actually a street that was known to be populated by brothels and houses of prostitution. So uh, basically it's a painting of prostitutes standing in a window. Analytic cubism is the idea of analyzing something from different points of view and then compressing those points of view together into one painting. 
that evolves over time into what's called synthetic cubism. And that was affected also by collage technique. Uh, collage being the idea that instead of um, painting an image of a piece of fruit, for example, you would actually cut out of a, a magazine a, a different image of a piece of fruit and paste that uh, using that collage technique. So that affects synthetic cubism. And as the term synthetic implies, it, it takes on more of a man-made constructed look than the earlier analytic cubism. Um, so here's an example of synthetic cubism with these three musicians by Picasso and it looks like uh, some of the shapes are actually cut out and pasted onto the canvas and they might have been. One of Picasso's uh, most well-known works and one that's very political in nature we've looked at before in class, Guernica from 1937. And this painting is really iconic, especially in the 20th century, because it represents the first uh, firebombing of a town by airplanes, first time in history that that had happened. Um, and that was part of the Spanish Civil War, and the general that ordered this attack um, got air support from Hitler's Nazi Germany. And the result, of course, was death and destruction and, and chaos. And it's a really emotional piece. It's very large. It's over 20 feet long. Uh, it certainly had a big impact. Lots of iconic imagery in this painting, like the bull itself being uh, and it usually seen as a symbol of Spain. And here it has a spear going through its head, uh, the broken sword, the woman holding her dead child, which kind of reminds us of the Pieta, the idea of Mary holding a dead Christ, a light bulb, which we think of light as being kind of symbolic of um, thought and progress and goodness, but here the light is kind of used ironically as if to say if, if this is technological progress, then what have we done? Is, is this really enlightenment? Is this really the right direction uh, for humanity to be going in? It's a really powerful statement. In Italy, a movement gets going called Futurism uh, that is about motion and speed. And Futurism was influenced by Cubism. Um, some of the Futurist pieces still look like they're being seen from different vantage points and points of view, but the emphasis becomes on motion and the idea of man moving forward into the future. Futurism is a really optimistic movement, and it's all the technology evolving in the 20th century as being a positive thing that would benefit mankind. So it's celebrated in artwork uh, as forward motion into the future. The artist Marcel Duchamp, French artist, was involved in lots of different movements. Um, here he's being influenced by cubism, by futurism, as you can see with the motion. Uh, and he's also being influenced by photography, stroboscopic photography. So uh, photo experiments at this time were being conducted with motion. So as, for example, as someone walked down the stairs, they would be hit with multiple flashes uh, to study locomotion and the movement of people and animals and machines. Um, and so that influenced this painting, New Descending a Staircase. Uh, you can also see that cubist influence. It almost looks like a analytical cubist piece in the style of Picasso or Brock. Uh, the piece was criticized by uh, one art critic as an explosion in a shingle factory uh, when it came to the United States. Here's another example of futurist art, unique forms of continuity in space. Abstracted human form, uh, it looks like it's moving ahead in space so fast that features of the person are being blown back. So there's that optimistic celebration of technological advancement, humans moving forward into the future. World War I was referred to as the war to end all wars. Something on this scale of conflict had never happened before in history, and uh, there were many people that probably thought it was going to be the end of the world. Um, death and destruction that's uh, just on a massive scale machines that are being used to kill other people, machines flying through the air, dropping bombs, killing people, big big uh, tanks, machines that, that roll around, shooting uh, machine guns for the first time in history. Um, and of course this affected artists as well. And 
one way that it affected artists was the idea that all of the classical culture, like we talked about classical culture, like ancient Greece and Rome and how it influenced um, many aspects of the world today, the Dada artists looked at all that, looked at that 2,000 years of classical cultural influence as being a, a sinister thing because all that, according to them, had led up to World War One. So the French academic history paintings of things like uh, Napoleon riding across the battlefield and war being seen as something that was a noble undertaking uh, and was part of your civic duty, that idea is being heavily criticized. Um, as a mistake, as uh, misleading. Keep in mind this is a time when uh, photography was very active too, so unlike many wars of the past, uh, people were seeing photographs of what actually happens during war, so it, it wasn't this glamorous um, heroism that was depicted in artwork sometimes, it was actually uh, this really horrible, awful stuff, and in what's referred to as the Great War or the War to End All Wars, uh, this this war affects virtually everyone on the planet in some way or another. So the Dada artists started thinking about that in terms of artwork itself, and if 2,000 years of classical culture led up to this destruction, then maybe art itself had to be reinvented, and in order to reinvent art, art had to be destroyed. And one way to do that was to make it complete nonsense. Um, to explore the idea of irrational thought. Um, to completely destroy artwork. So Dada, in a way, was an anti-art movement. You could say it was against art. And the word Dada itself doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's a nonsense word, um, just like the idea of nonsense art. So if you see Dada artwork during this period as being about nonsense, as being about anti-art, then this piece makes a little more sense. Um, it's by Marcel Duchamp, the artist we looked at earlier with Nude Descending a Staircase. Uh, and this piece, great example of Dada, it's a urinal that's turned on its side. It's signed Armut, 1917. and it was entered into and then rejected from an art exhibition. Considered by some people to be a very important piece in art history. Um, it was the first ready-made, and the idea of ready-made art is that something is already made, that the artist didn't make it, they just appropriated it and used it as art. This is going to affect um, a lot of artwork. It's a revolutionary idea for art. So art no longer becomes about the technical process of showing you what things visually look like or exploring visual ideas. Now it's it's about ideas themselves. So it really transforms um, the way art is being thought about at this time. The ready-made. Here's another Dada piece by Marcel Duchamp and in a way, it's another ready-made because Marcel Duchamp didn't make this print of the Mona Lisa. And, of course, he didn't do the original painting that was uh, Leonardo da Vinci. But he took the print, um, which was a ready-made piece of artwork, and he changed it a little bit, drawing a goatee mustache and a beard onto the Mona Lisa and then writing some letters at the bottom. And the letters at the bottom are an acronym. Uh, for saying and basically it means uh, she has a hot ass so it's an insult to the Renaissance it's an insult to da Vinci um, it's an insult to the history of art again with that not a idea that art itself had to be destroyed that it had to be reinvented um, there's a lot of humor involved in Dada work uh, because it is nonsensical and sometimes that humor is really dark um, other examples of Dada artwork would include the idea of taking something that's useful and making it useless. If you recall in the chapter we talked about fine applied art, the difference between art and craft, and sometimes if you have a useful item, even though it might be very beautiful, someone would refer to that uh, as craft instead of art. But if it was something that could not be used for any other purpose, 
then it's aesthetic visual qualities then that must be an artwork so the Dada artists often would take useful objects um, and make them useless and in that way they were transforming them into art uh, an example would be um, an iron for ironing clothes uh, with spikes put into it so then it becomes useless and it also becomes kind of this intimidating sort of weapon like object and that's a commentary on the use of technology in war the Dada artists uh, were really interested in machines and they saw the future of technology in a, a very pessimistic way so they they didn't look at it the same way as the futurists who saw technology as kind of being the savior of humanity the Dada artists saw technology that threatened to destroy man and man itself in danger of someday becoming a machine because they revered them so much and spent so much of their time and energy uh, being involved with machines. Under content, I'm going to include a link uh, to a pretty good YouTube video about Dada history. It's got some neat stuff in there. Um, check it out. And that will bring us to an end of the week. I will see you guys on Monday. We'll talk some more about art between the wars. And um, in the news today was that in Afghanistan, the U.S. used, uh, I think, the biggest non-nuclear bomb in history. And that just happened. Um, so, you know, history repeats itself. Uh, we see technology again. Uh, being used in this way to blow people to pieces. Um, stuff to think about. Anyway, have a super weekend. Be safe. Enjoy the weather. Don't forget about the weekly discussion board. And also don't forget, I don't care about all this factual information and big words and... Um, things that are copied and pasted off the internet you don't get credit for that I don't care about that I want to know what you think about the question I don't care what uh, you know somebody from the website the Museum of Metropolitan Art I, I don't care about what they say I want to know what you think I want to know what you think and that's how you get credit for it hey have a great weekend see you later